wrote this down and then I shared it with Mike and I thought this was Marcelli Iliad. All these people tried to put the myth in time. But the reality is, is how you look at time determines what you think a myth is. So Marcelli Iliad, he looked at things through creation. How many of you know the creation story was not about what happened, and this is what I've said for years, Christianity is more emphasizing when something happened rather than the nature of what happened. Or the fact that it did. Well, and the fact is, is that, yeah, rather than the when, because we've been caught up in the when. Then, as I talked about in the book of Daniel, when Hebrew and Babylon was mixed, and then in the cross and the Gospels, you look at Rene Girard, who talked about scapegoating, but then in 70 AD we seen the temple destroyed, and Rudolf Bultmann's views was that everything was fulfilled except for the Christ. And then you have the present moment, which is more Karen Armstrong. Now, why is this kind of crazy? And then I was looking at the Zodiac, which is Paulo Suarez. You know, Suarez, I was reading the Cypher of Genesis, and he used a term that really threw me. He talked about obsolete myths and mythical reality. That's a term that's odd to us because mythical reality sounds like a contradiction. But you have to understand that every one of these has to do with a perspective of where they were in time. But we're coming to present truth. How many of you know present truth is outside of time? So when I listen to people, I understand that they only have, just like myself, only have a perspective depending on what I've looked at. And so when I connected these, I thought, well, this is interesting because as you see the Bible evolve, so is their perspectives. And so you're saying, well, you know, I agree with him and disagree with him. So do I. I agree with this one, so do I. But it's not a this or that. That's where duality comes in. It's understanding the perspectives from where people are. People come to me sometimes and say, man, this is absolutely a verse that I believe in. Yeah, I do too, based on the perspective of where that was. But... I'll get into maybe, I'm not, I might be able to connect this, but that's what I saw when he put this up here, because every person looks at myth, even the other, um, you know, you have the Chinese story of creation, you have the Egyptian story of creation, I'm not going to trust their translators anymore than I trust mine. A guy one time tried to get me to read the Koran, and I told him, I said, no, I want the original. I don't trust King Jimmy. Why do you think I trust anything else? And a lot of these histories, and here's the thing, I see a lot linguistically that I can't prove in history, but I'm starting to prove it because of all the internet and things that are happening. We have access to information that we didn't have before. My guy and I was in a bookstore yesterday, and I walked over and said something to Elena, and I thought, well, this is going to be the end of this. I've known her for years. In fact, she helps me find rare books. She's right over here. Come to find out, man, she knew more about it than I did. How many of y'all know that's the case? That we're seeing these people, and this is what I have said for years, and I'll say this, and then we'll invite John to come up. There is a people that have been hidden for this moment and for this hour. Amen, I believe Amen. that. And they have been waiting <laughs> to hear a sound. And we've not seen these people mobilized because they're still waiting for the sound. But when the time's right, and I've known that lady for years, bought charismatic books from her, never even knew. And, and she, I was sitting there talking, I said, well, you study this? She goes, yeah, there's a certain book. Well, she's in the bookstore. I didn't realize her bookstore is in her house. So she went to the back and come back. She goes, oh, it's this book. I thought, am I allowed back there? I want to see what you know. But it's really interesting. So just even in this, time together. We're in the present moment. There's never going to be a time like there is right now. There's never going to be the combination and the connection like there is. Because every moment is special because we're creating. We've had uh, John a few times and we gave him one time ten minutes and he took nine. We've had several times that he's made comments and said stuff over a period of time and so I talked to Mike. Mike had some questions and I said, let's just give him some time 
and let him explain how he sees things. And uh, we've just been so honored because we've only been able to give him a little bit of time. But so this conference, we decided we're going to give you a lot of time. Sorry it took us so long, but that's the way I am. You know, people who try to run over and say everything, I'm like, okay, this guy ain't. If you're really pushing to say something, you probably don't have a lot to say. But if you're pacing with it, it means there's a whole lot of picture that we don't get. So without further ado, well, just a second. my wife is up. Well, normally up. he would show up and he wouldn't be on the schedule to speak. So, but when we have people come and they we have an open space, we try to give them a little bit of time as a little you know. And so he would come and say, "Well, John, you got 20 minutes. That's not enough time." <laughs> so now we're giving you triple that. So <laughs> giving you an hour. But also before he comes up, you go ahead and start coming up. Um, we have a bit more refreshments out. We got fresh coffee, fresh water, and of course we have our products. Mike's got some stuff back there. We have some CDs, but we also have an offering box. We don't charge for our conferences, but uh, we do take up an offering to facilitate the cost of the, of the room and to, for future conferences. So God leads lead you. We appreciate your offering and your blessings. Thank you. Thank you for for having me. I appreciate your your attitude and your heart. I uh, appreciate you, Mark, and the team, all of you that come here. Do I need this? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. I wish I had a mic stand. I'm sorry. It's something I got in bed. Talk loud. I think you'd want to kill it. I don't think it'll pick up. Well, I would like my sister, Carolyn, to come up here and sing a song. Is that okay? <coughs> come on up here, Carolyn. And then I, come on, she might say. It's just, uh, yes. I feel honored to be her brother. My brother. He loves me. I do. He is a wonderful pastor to me and many, many people. Him and his wife, George, have a heart of love for all people. <laughs> and so John asked me to sing this song. Can we sing? Yeah, unless you have a particular other one you feel like it. I got the whole bunch. Yeah, whole bunch. They never asked me to sing, by the way. <laughs> That's for it. I want to hear it. I know. But Rokas and I were traveling some years ago in Arkansas at the time, heading to a meeting in Little Rock. And um, I had a visitation with Yeshua. And I heard him singing this song to me through me. Oh, my God. And it totally changed my life. So. <clears throat> <clears throat> Don't put me in a place that I don't want to be in. I just want to walk with you and be your constant friend. I'm the love, peace, and happiness that comes from deep within. Don't put me in a place that I Don't put me in a place that I don't want. 
you please. Now it's time to rent the veil and know that you are me. So don't yes. put me in a place that I don't want to be in. I just want to walk with you and be your constant friend. I'm the love, peace, and happiness that comes from deep within. Don't put me in a place that I don't want to be in. No, I just, not too much, but I do want to say I know the work involved in creating this conference, Kathy and Mark, and Mike and Beth, and I appreciate the open platform, and I appreciate the desire to truly know and to understand instead of going by the status quo. It takes a lot of time and effort in leaving the minds and the reputation that people might put on you and really searching, being a seeker. And it says, you know, if you seek, you shall find. And I love the open heart and the open mind that I feel with all of you, and it's a privilege to be here. Thank you. You want to be proud to be your brother? <clears throat> now I'm going to ask Barbara to come up here and pray. I just like to pray. Okay? Come on up here, Barbara. And just, just, she's a, just a wonderful minister. I don't know if you all know her, but she's a wonderful minister. And she's also a co conspirator with me about bringing the kingdom here. Just pray. Can you just pray that you. Okay. We're so grateful, Father, yes. Yes. for this day and this opportunity, this moment in time now. And you've designed these collective souls to be here that there might be a greater opening over the whole state of Arkansas. And that we might find precipitation today as you rain down upon us and that you move us into that place that you've created for us and we desire to be. That's a match, Father. We reach for you this afternoon. We give you praise. Bless John. Open up the book of John in his physical body this afternoon and let him speak from that place that he walks in. Yes. Truth and witness and signs and wonders. And we thank you for it. Amen. 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 Thank you. We're a multifaceted being. Yes. We're not just one. And I have a body, soul, and spirit. And... I am the body, soul, and spirit, I guess I should say. And the spirit. I don't know where to make those divine lines. I really don't want to make too much divine lines. But I want to be aware of every bit of me. Yeah. I want to be aware of every bit of me. Yeah. And I know that the Father has given us, and uh, I know there's been ac excesses there that sometimes we don't appreciate, Mark, and that you refer to. But I want, I want my emotional being to be open because that's part of who I am. Amen. That's part of who I am. And uh, my soul, my mind, things. I want to, uh, I don't want to be, I don't know if I say this word correctly, but it's, how do you say it, honey? Pedantic? Pedantic. Pedantic. I don't want to be too pandemic, and that's just catching all the nit gritty and all that kind of stuff, which I think uh, a lot of people like us do, <laughs> you know. But there's a reason we want to make certain issues, and it's not just so that we can say somebody didn't dot the T right and then uh, put the comma at the right place, dot the T. Okay, yeah, there we go. Okay, I do that a lot. Okay, so you gotta just love me anyway. But cross the T or dot the I, or put the comma in there, but sometimes there's a reason for this. Yeah. Sometimes there's a reason for this. And I want to draw to your attention something that I think most of you know, but first of all I want to say that really what I'm going to do today is try to present some fundamental truths, some fundamental understanding that is the reason we believe what we do. And it seems to me, if you don't have these fundamental reasons and uh, under courage, under 
understanding that it, it, it leads you places you don't really need to go. I'm not afraid of anything. I want to, that's the wrong way of saying that. I'm not really afraid of anything. But uh, there's, there's just certain things that just, why are we like we are? Why are we like, and then I'll tell you this joke that most of you have heard. This, this guy, Johnny, that's me, okay? And he had, he went to school and he had little problems and if I'm Trump, I'll get in trouble for this. And he said, why am I like this? Huh? And the teacher says, we love you, Johnny. We love you, but you just, you dear, we just love you, it's okay. And so he went to the <laughs> basketball court, you know, and to the coach. And he said, why am I like this? Huh? That's okay, we love you. You just you just we love you. So he went home and his mother was fixing something to eat. And uh, he went up to mom and said, Oh why am I like this? Huh? Oh, just go in there and watch TV with dad, Johnny, it's okay. So he nudged his dad, well his dad got him away from watching TV a little bit and and he said to his dad, Hey, why am I like this? Huh? And his dad looked over at him and said, Huh? <laughs> we are what we are because of where we came from. We are what we are because of where we came from. And I just wanted to start off with a little joke like that, but I want to tell you something that most of you know, and I hear this from the, uh, the ministry here, but I love this book that we call the Bible. But nowhere in the Scriptures do the Scriptures call the Scripture the Word of God. And you need to know that. Now I study it, not as much as I should, and I honor it, and I believe it's inspired by writings, and I'm like, I think uh, Mark or one of you said, maybe it was Mike, that there's no other book like that book. There's no other book through the history of mankind that's had such an influence on mankind as the Scriptures. But the Scriptures don't call the Scriptures the Word of God, like some of your fighting fundies do. And they make a big issue, and they make an idol out of the Scriptures. Now, I think... I study and believe the scriptures more than the fighting fundies. But they are unscriptural when they call the scriptures the word of God. Correct. So I, I might get to that if I have time to tell you why that is so important. Because I want to let you know if I get to that, where the word of God is. There is the word of God on the earth today. And I might want to get to that if I have time. And uh, but I'm not, I appreciate the time or not. But it's just that my wife's husband's sort of long-winded sometimes. But anyway, uh, it's important that we know that. That is that's so that we can get a grasp on what is. That's one of the fundamental issues that sets us on a course that seems to be apart from the. Christian theology, so-called. Okay. I really think if they really studied the scriptures, they'd believe like I do. And I guess most of you all believe that. I'm getting some, sorry, I don't get too many old me's, just some amens there, hopefully. So, <laughs> anyway, that's really an issue with me. And a lot of people say, John, why do you make that issue? And I might get to that a little bit later on, why I make that issue. But they say, just, just don't, don't say that. Don't say that. And then they come up and they start coming up with some scriptures and then if they study the scriptures, I think they find them right. <laughs> now, here's some other fundamental things here. I'm not too sure I can remember that. I want to go back. 
there's something happening across the nation, across this nation. I don't know. I'm not in other nations. I don't know if it's all over the world, but I sort of have a feeling it is. And that is, you see it advertised on TV all the time. It's Ancestry.com. You see that? Ancestry.com. And then you have this other thing that says 23andMe.com. Did you see that one? You can, you can send in for your DNA uh, kit. They send it to you. I think it's 100 bucks, $99 or something like that. And it's the 23 chromosomes. And they're wanting to find out who they are. They want to find out where they came from. And they want to find out how does that affect them. That's what I want to talk to you about. But I'm not promoting Ancestry.com. I've never looked at that. I've never had my DNA checked at 23 chromosomes or 23 and me. But I sort of like to do that, get around to it, sort of be interested. I think I know a little bit about it, but I, I really, uh, really probably don't know too much about it. It might be something in there I don't want to know about, you know. <laughs> There might be something there we don't know about. <laughs> so, well, but in the beginning, God, that's Elohim, in the beginning, Elohim said, let us make man in our own image. Now, I want to talk a little bit about that. First of all, the us in your religious world thinks they're talking about the Trinity or they're not sure. Maybe it's just going to be in there or something like that, okay? But I'll let you all work on that one a little bit. But he, what he was really saying is, and the man is Adam there, he's really saying, let us invest ourselves. This is the final the act of the seven days of creation there. Is that, let us invest ourselves in Adam. He wasn't separating himself, Elohim, from Adam. He said, uh, and I'll even go as far as this, and he said make, that we might make him in our own image. Excuse me. Okay? I figure you all know the scripture. So, uh, let us make man in our image. Okay? And so we think, okay. Well, if you have just a reflection of something, you raise your right hand when you when you go into the mirror there and you raise your right hand and it's your left hand raised up. You ever notice that? It sort of goes backwards a little bit. So I don't think he's talking about a reflection here. I don't think he's saying, okay, let's make something that reflects us. But I really think if you get in there, what the scripture is really trying to indicate there is that the, the Elohim, that word God in the King James there, is saying we're going to invest ourselves in something, and this is different than the other creative acts. This is a whole other aspect that we're doing. We're not just creating it, and it has things in there that uh, it lets you know it's a whole different thing in there. I won't go into all those different scriptures, but it's saying, let us invest ourselves in this other thing, and we're going to call it Adam, but I sort of feel, feel like that he said, that they said, we're going to create something that we might inhabit to demonstrate us. Is that okay? Yes. Can you go with me a little bit on that? Yeah. This isn't just another further evolution of the, of the creative acts of God. This is a whole other aspect of Himself that He's going to find something that he can be in, in the earth. And the first time it's talking about it, when he created there, that word is really talking about cut out of him to create. Later on, I think it's it, when it talks about any form, Adam, it's talking about really picking up out of the dust and pushing it together and sort of consecrate, just sort of, just pushing it in a, it's pushing together that, Next word there, form there. It's not the same word as the created one that we put himself out of and he created this. So here we have this Adam.
That's God. That's man. That's God. I don't know. You guys can figure all this stuff out. I'll leave a whole bunch. I just want to tease you a little bit so that you might think about some of these things. And then, because when it's given the genealogy of our Savior, the Holy One of Israel, in Luke, it goes backwards. Matthew goes one way, Luke it goes backwards. You know, And it says, who was the son of Adam? Who was the son of God? No question about it, who they're talking about. This is what the Scripture talks Old Testament, New Testament. It talks about genealogy. It talks about where are you coming from? What's going on here? Right. Now, I have trouble with the thought that the Lord God killed a bear and found some bear skin to put on Adam and eat when they realized they were naked. Oh, yeah. I have a little trouble with that thought. I have a little, uh, it doesn't quite compute to me. But there's a lot of things before that time that happened that suggest that they, they were doing things but they obviously were what I would consider in a different form than what we call our Adam man right now. Mm -hmm. There was something was going on because they were they were doing, you just read that and things were happening and they were supposed to be doing stuff. But I don't really think that they, I have, I'll leave that up to you, I can't really, I just have trouble believing that we were in the same form that we are now before he made his clothes of skin. And if you really study the clothes of skin, you'll find out that means a covering of different. You guys study words way better than I do. I'm, I have, I'm not good at that at all. We do try to figure out what the day is, and today is 351 days since the beginning of this year, since the last spring equinox. And that means what, honey? Our students know. 300 means wisdom. 50 means... No, it's 352 today. Mm -hmm. And then it means wisdom, and 50 means covering or anointing. And, and two, means two means house. House. So we figure this out every day. House. What? Wisdom is covering. Wisdom is covering the house. That's what this. Beautiful. That's what the word in Hebrew means for the 352nd day since the last spring equinox, when Moses said, "We'll count this as the beginning of the year." So it's a little throw a little something else in there for you to. We study those things and we write them out the best we can. As you know, you Hebrews, there's 22 different letters and there's 22 different ways to explain that in the English language of what that word means. <coughs> so, opening a door, or whatever, you know, there's, there's, if you study that, it, it means a whole lot of stuff. So, okay. Where am I at now? Let me get back here on the thought. I just threw that in there. So we have... God preparing a place for a habitation of himself. Yes. They called it Adam. To me, that's fundamental. Mm -hmm. okay. If you don't understand that, you're all you're trying to figure out something separate from yourself. You're trying to figure out something that you don't. Now he, I give him the glory. I get. I believe in worship and I believe in praise. And some people, when I talk like this, they, well, what's the purpose of worship and praise? I tell you what, there's something in me in the very cells of this physical body that want to cry out, as a Father. Yes. That want to cry out, I love you, Father. That wants to worship the great I Am. That wants to come into a different dimension. Because I am actually connected with that, and He created the cells of my body, and He created every part of me, my emotions, my every part of me. He created that, that we might be Him on the earth. And that we might worship Him, and that we might do His work, His work and His plan. That we didn't come here just trying to find an experience. We came here with a mission. 
We came here with a mission. We really did. We came here with a purpose and a plan. And we're discovering that. He's so powerful, he hides that. He's so powerful, he hides that. Now, if you want some scripture for it, Jeremiah, this is what he says. It says, it says before I was in my mama's belly. Jeremiah 1.5, I think. Before, he, this isn't after conception. This is before conception. Before I was in my mama's belly, you knew me. What's he talking about? If you didn't think you were around before then, he says, before I was in my mama's belly, you knew me. Wow. That gives you, if anybody wants to say, hey, you just, it's an imagination. You got an ego that you can't understand, and you got to think that you were here before 63, four years ago, however old I am. And I think, oh, I got to think that. I got to help that for, for my own ego that I might just be able to expand or something. But the scriptures say that about Jeremiah. And of course, there in 139 in uh, the Psalms of David, there, and he says, You knitted me together. This is after in the woman's womb, okay? You knitted me together. And you deform me, and that's really talking about embroidery work. And when you think about the double helix, it's really what it's talking about. They didn't have the same kind of words back then that we have today in the scientific way to describe it. But they're, they're talking about how the Father formed us. Where am I going with this, John? What are you talking about? Why are you making an issue about this? Well, there's a couple reasons that I think is very important to those of us that are seekers, that are seeking the truth of who we are, what we are, and why we are, that we might know where we came from. If we just think we're an accident some, going somewhere to happen, well, then it's, okay, you got saved, and now God's got to come up with a plan for you. No, that's not what's the deal. Am I making sense to you? Yes. Is it? Are you? Dorcas helps me sometimes. You know, well, he said that backwards, so don't let me do that. We can read that. Okay, now, in Ezekiel, it says a hundred times, it says, Son of Man, Son of Man, Son of Man, that's Son of Adam, that's not Son of Enosh, that's not saying Ish, that's Adam, Son of Adam, Son of Adam, this is the one that's back there in Genesis. This is the one back in Genesis. And it's letting you know there's things that really belong to you that you don't know. And he had to get touched by the Spirit to even dare prophesy yes. what he was seeing. He had to get touched by the Spirit. He had to get, he had to get moved by another dimension before he was even afraid, and you know, you, I can go with a lot about Ezekiel. It's talked about it, prophesied about these bones, Israel. You know, you know all that stuff. And can they live? You know, I don't know. You know, he didn't have much hope. He saw the first part of Ezekiel. Man, he's telling all the bad stuff. Did you ever notice how the progression of a lot of the prophets from the beginning and where they end, from the things that they talk about, it's sort of rough. Yeah, it's sort of a little bit of a thing that happens to us, hopefully. But it seems like we get awakened to things that are out of order so that we might find a way to bring it into order and find his purpose. And that, and that way it goes. Did you see that in mankind and with you individually? We get awakened and it's like people are like, man, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear about all that stuff out of order and everything's chaos and all this kind of stuff. And obviously it is, but huh, I don't want to be that. But you watch them. Sometimes they get stuck there. People get stuck at that place. But sometimes 
if they're a real prophet, I don't want to say that. Who knows? They may be supposed to be a real prophet, but we'll put something on somebody that's not meant for them to be. But they'll get stuck there. And maybe they are. But there are those that are called to progressively go in to the secret places of the Father. And even though they might see Israel in disarray and out of order, totally just read the scripture. They're just totally out of order, and they call for the prophet to come in and prophesy against them. Very conveyable. You know where I'm at there. And they prophesy against them, and they say, I see Israel in order. Read right before that. They weren't in order. They were in rebellion against Moses. They weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were, in, But he, somehow some light comes in. And he said, now look, you're going to pay me to do this, and I want the money. He reads, and he wanted the money. And he says, but I can only say what he says to me. And he even said, there's going to rise one out of Israel. <laughs> that will change everything. And you'll be scattered in Israel right on high. Wow. Wow. They saw something beyond what it looked like. They saw the real thing. Who wants to see the real thing? Yes. I want to see the real thing. The thing that's beyond what it looks like. The thing that we belong to be. That's where I want to be. And you said, don't get to know yourself. And I'm talking about getting to know myself. It's just coming from a little bit different angle than what you, you said. You want to hear what I got? This is what burns me up. This is what eats me. This is what, what, con what consumes me is that I might find that that I am and might discover those things that are about me and about those that I am of like kind about and find those things and walk in that and do what He wants me to do and do what I'm programmed to do. We're programmed. The reason I'm talking about the DNA, I got white hair now. I used to be black. And I used to have a lot of it. My dad had black hair. And he had a lot of it. It didn't fall out like mine did. I think I got that from my mother's side, you know? There's certain things, like my joke was saying, we're just programmed to be. And we're just a little different. Not sure. Everybody thinks that in God's plan, everything's going to be the same. You can't find that in the Scripture. If you really study the Scripture, you can't find that. His love goes out to all creation and all mankind. And as we return unto Him in our rightful places, everything. Scripture says it like this in the Phillips translation. All creation is standing on tiptoe, waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God. Wow. All creation, we're going to move into things. And we're not just going up. Uh, some of this, excuse me, I'll digress a little bit here. But sometimes I go to meetings and it sounds like the self-improvement kits. You know, it sounds like you're, you you went to some place and they, they want to tell you how to get better. And it's all about you. And it's just, well, that's good. But the reason we go through our trials and our tribulations and stuff so that the product that comes in might be refined gold. And it might be for the purpose of God. And if we have a lot of baggage on us, we need to get rid of that. And we need to get that refined. And we need to find His purpose and His plan in us and put those other things down in us but I agree with Mark. I'm not looking for the bad. It's only in their kind of thing. I don't go there. You know, like you're saying some of the denominations and stuff. And it's like, well, oh, I go up to them, repent about this and I repent about that. Uh, I don't, I just, I have trouble with, with that kind of uh, mentality in some of the church services. How much time do I have? Where am I at? Do I use 30 minutes up yet? You're good. You still got about 25. You still got another 25? I'll give you a 10-minute order. Thank you. <coughs> I'm making more time for you. Well, I talked to you about the Son of Man in Ezekiel. Now I want to talk to you about the Son of Man in the New Testament. 88 times it's used in the in the uh, Gospels and Acts there. And I think a little bit of Revelation. Uh, and it's, it just depends which translation you use. Rather, it's the Revised King James or the King James. Rather, it's 84 or 88. 
But there's a, something a little different on that, according to Bollinger. You know, I agree with that. You know, how do we like, don't we just love the translations that agree with you? You just like, man, that's a, I like this. This guy hit it, you know? And so maybe I should be a better scholar. But um, it says there's the definite article there, which means the son of man. Son of man, really. It's, yeah, the Greek doesn't really show that. Adam there was. But anyway, it's the son of man. This one, whom we call the Holy One of Israel, the Redeemer of Israel, the Savior of all mankind, whom some call Jesus, I call Yahashua, but however you want to, just so you know who I'm talking about, this is the Son of Adam. This isn't just Son of Adam, stand up and I'm going to put something on you that causes you to do something that you didn't think you can do, but this son of Adam is the son of Adam. This is where you belong to live. This is who you really are. This is who you are from the ages before we incarnated and became flesh. This is what you belong to be. This is the son of Adam. This is the one that is in union with the great I Am. This is the one that has conquered all these things. This is who you are to demonstrate. Take your jacket. Bring my pants if you need it. York just says, no, wear the jacket. But I always take them off. <laughs> I always take them off. I'm not just talking about something 2,000 years ago. I'm not talking about an event that happened 2,000 years ago, and all of a sudden there's someone that comes that is the real son of Adam. That's not who I'm talking about. That is who I'm talking about. That's not really what I'm talking about. I'm using him as the example. But there is a people today that are the son of Adam on the earth with a definite article. Yes. The son of Adam on the earth. That one that's in relationship with him. That one that was formed to be a manifestation or an expression or a habitation for the holy invisible realm. That's who I'm talking about. Does that make sense to you? That there's a people on the earth today and that is what we are. We are the son of Adam on the earth. And we get confused. We think, well, we're supposed to do this. And we're supposed to do that. And we're supposed to not do this. And we're supposed to not do that. It's not about that. It's about our relationship. That what we might say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. If you've seen me, you've seen what it is. Wow. Then people get me accused of saying, preaching I am God, and I don't really like that message. <laughs> because of some other stuff that goes with it. But it sounds pretty close. <laughs> Are you still friendly with me, Mark? Mm -hmm. She's pretty gracious. I have no idea what you believe on these kind of things. I really don't. It doesn't matter what we believe anyway. Oh. That's really true. It's what you understand. Now, I want to... I, I want to explain a couple things to you. I want to use a couple examples here. We have a, a building that was our first church building. We don't like to call it church because we are the church body. That's the ecclesia, the ones that come out. King James required it to be church so people think it's a church building. But we know who the real church is, right? But there's this building that we were building. We're trying to do it a little bit different. Dad was around, this is about 40 years ago, about 38 years ago now. And we were put these plastic poles up, this PVC pipe, and made it into a sort of a dome shape, and then we stretched it out over a rectangular building we were building, and we'd like to do things different. We just like to do things different. Dorcas says, why do you just always try to make it a hard way sometimes? She says, when we're building something, but I don't know what we did. We just, and I was uh, in my mid-twenties, maybe like twenties, 
it was about four years. I was 22 when we moved out there, so it was a few years after that. And so we're up about 14 foot. We have this old sawmill we had bought, and I cut lumber that went narrow at one end and wide at the other, and anything but straight came out. And I was just learning and all this stuff. And we had this scaffold up there. But we had this idea that if we could put this plastic or bisqueen, uh, thin plastic, you know, and if we could put it up over top of this little frame we made to hold it in shape and pull it down, that we could spray it with urethane, polyurethane, and that it would stay there. And everybody said, you're going to lose money. It's not going to do it. And we didn't really have a whole lot of money to lose. But that was going to be about ten thousand dollars and stuff that was a lot of money where were you going to find the money much less if we were all the money losing so we're putting it up there and zara and i were on this homemade scaffold and i have a couple of zara and i and a couple of young boys and we're we're putting it up and we got brooms and we don't want to rip it and we sold it together and we're putting it up and the building was just 60 by 30 but it was big to us and we're and it's high and we got a big long roll and you think well plastic's light but you get that much of it and you try to put it up where you want to it's not that easy we found out and we were working all day and we just got tired and it's not going to happen we got to figure out a different way to do this do you ever come up and think you got to have a different way to do it mm -hmm. I won't tell you about the different way that we did it we got down off the scaffold, and my daddy comes walking up pathway. And then he walks up there, and he said, "Well, why don't you just try it one more time? Did you ever be fishing all night? Ever anybody go fishing all night? Well, I was fishing all night, man. I was tired." And I didn't get too tired back then when in my 20s. So, yes, sir. Sometimes you just got to say, yes, sir. Here, get there. So, Ed wasn't demanding of it. He wasn't. He just said, well, I just think y'all try it one more time, guys. And we got it up there, and a light wind came. And got underneath the bisqueen. And it just sort of fell down in place. I love it. And all we had to do was pull it ten feet this way and five foot that way. But it was already got unfolded and it just sort of landed there so that we could go on with our project. Now i got something to tell you about this. We talked about that story. The children, i got 32 grandchildren. They weren't around. Half my children weren't around at the time. We talked about it. I think sometimes I think it's a myth. <laughs> a myth. Sometimes I think it is. But it really happened. But the stories get exaggerated a little bit. And it gets moved around. I'm not getting after you guys. I just I think I'm free to say this. But I think a lot of the things, the reason you know where I'm going on this, but it really happened. But it we listen to the history of Elohim City how it comes out of our children and our grandchildren. And Dorcas and I scratch our heads like, man, how does that really, how did that, that doesn't quite sound like it did when we lived through it. It doesn't quite sound the same. And we've only been there 42 years. And they hear the stories, and it doesn't sound the same. There's a lot of stories that we have that really, and it doesn't quite sound the same in 42 years, not even a half a century. And it starts, and it's all our people. <laughs> and it's my children and my grandchildren and my nieces and my nephews and everybody that's, nobody's in there trying to twist it around. It doesn't quite sound like it. Even some of the other ones that have been there. Of course, I'm the only one that knows the right story. You know that. Right? All the rest of them, the ones that were there, they, got, they forgot something. Then we have another man there. His name is Jim Allison. And he uh, he was the head of CSA. You ever hear of CSA? Hmm? And before CSA was raided and they collapsed that and destroyed that community, they were going to uh, 
charge him with something. And uh, he came out of the lawyer's office there in Yaleville. And all of a sudden, all these undercover cops were there. And it really was a trumped up stuff that they just totally dismissed afterwards. But I was right there. And all of a sudden, I saw him take off running. What's going on, man? I was like naive and naive, you know. I didn't know this was had undercover cops there and stuff. I was just there trying to help figure out how to get some money to situate to calm the situation down and uh, the foreclosure and stuff like that. And behind the courthouse, about a block and a half away at Yaleville, there's a 20-foot drop, and he went running and hit that and just jumped off into the ravine. I was there. I didn't know where he went. <laughs> Gone. I was outside. I was in with the lawyers. I think, I'm trying to pull it back now. I was in with, at the lawyer's desk there, yeah. And we just, and he just kept having somebody come and whisper in his ear, like, what's this about? <clears throat> Anyway, he jumped off there. I get all this too much detail on there. Take up the time on that. And he jumped off. And then they looked for him, and he found an, the roots of a tree and sort of hid up underneath the tree. And he said he had white socks on. He said, "I never wear white socks again." <laughs> and his foot was out there with his pant leg up. And he said they walked right by him, but they had to go around, you know, and get down there. Never could find him. Then after he came out that evening, then he went to the lawyer and got it all taken care of and there wasn't anything, but they were going to try to arrest him on some false pretenses back then. Well, I'm really taking a little too much time on that story. I don't really want to talk about the story, but that's another thing that really happened. But boy, when you hear those stories, I mean, it was a 50-foot cliff. He was underneath that tree for five days. <laughs> It was just, it didn't sound like the same at all that I was there. But there's truth behind it. There's truth behind it. There's truth behind it. And I believe the scriptures are very mythical. I believe they, they, they give you ideas of what was going on. And I, I read that about us taking on our incarnation of Adam. And I wonder, so I got some ideas what was going on, and that's what I was trying to explain a few minutes ago, where these ideas came from. Because I think something like that happened. But how it really happened, and all that stuff, I don't know, but I think we do at this service trying to figure out all those details. Because I agree with the scholars that have been up here, we don't really know how that But the point is, what happened? And if the Father gives someone insight on how something happened, I'm going to believe that until he gives me insight different. Does that make sense? Now there's another thing I want to talk about. And that is... Oh, well, I'll just say this... Uh, I'm not trying to defend the scripture here. I just believe it. I have it. And what I don't understand is confusing to me. But it doesn't have to line up with my understanding. Okay? And I do think that ten minutes, I think I do think that there's all kinds of mistranslations and all that, and I study all the different translations and things like that. But the power of the Holy Spirit comes to enlighten us. It comes to enlighten us about things. And I just took those two funny stories to tell you. In this life, in my short life, I have things that have happened that almost sound, how could that be? How could that be in my short life? How can you go fishing all night and the fish be on the other side of the boat? 
how can that be? There's a, if we go over in Paul's writings, and he talks about the shadow. The law is the shadow of things to come, right? The law is just, it's, 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 a, it's a shadow, and it's really talking about him. And he uses Yahshua, because that was the event that was there. That was the sun that was right there. So he uses, that's just talking about him, all these shadows. i got something to tell you about the shadow. I don't worship the shadow. We shouldn't worship the shadow. I'm not upset with the shadow. I'm excited about the shadow. Because you know why there's a shadow? Because there's a body of Christ moving across the earth. There's a body of him himself that causes the shadow to show up. That's why the shadow is there. If there wasn't a body moving around, there would be no shadow. So people get, and I, I, I disagree with a lot of the different religious stuff. And that's just a shadow. We belong to be the Christ in the earth, living in the Christ, being the Christ. But the body of Christ causes a shadow to move. It causes it to rearrange. It causes something to be there so that you might, those that can't quite live in there, those that can't quite get a hold of it right now, that they might be able to look at the shadow and know something is happening. And there's a shadow coming across the earth today. And it's the sons of God, it's the Christ in the earth moving and causing things to happen. Hallelujah. And people get all carried away with the shadow. People get all, I'm not talking about the law now, the 1500 year shadow. I'm talking about things that are happening today. And they get all excited about the shadow because the body caused this to happen. And whoa, I don't like that happening. And some will say, whoa, I really like that happening. But it's the body of Christ in the earth today. That makes sense? That's what the shadows. And I, I lift us up above the shadows. I, Dad used to love singing that song. Lift us up above the shadows. Because we see the shadows. And we're not just talking about the old laws and all that kind of stuff. But we see the outworking. We see the outworking. And then the other thing, there's a song. I, they got all these new songs. And I love worship and praise. If you ever come to our place, humble yourself and come up that dirt road and see us. And if you come to a Sabbath meeting, you'll see half of it is worship and praise and dancing and getting all kinds of stuff going on. That's what that's what we do, and I love that. But they have songs that I don't know where they came from. One of them, Dorcas might help me with this, it says, Leave Behind the Sinning. How's that going, honey? Can you give me any more of it? I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> it's like, where did he get this song? My concrete heart won't stop. My concrete heart won't stop. He'll never. What? Sing like it's the first time. My concrete heart won't stop. Then leave behind the sinning. Leave behind the sinning. Not lost in the darkness. Uh, why am I bringing that in? It seems like... Oh man, I didn't get to... i got to get this really quick. Give me what i got about. Three minutes, five minutes. Okay. Uh, it seems like when there's a fresh move of God, it seems like some of us that have been in the things of God for a while, it's like we sort of get cynical. And it's like we can't. But I tell you what, I want you to do this. Whenever he speaks, go for it all, all the while. And all you can do is fall flat on your face. All you can do is make a mistake and a fool of yourself. But it's well worth it. It's well worth it. Don't be a cynic to where it isn't worth it. Now, the reason I, I'm sorry, I about forgot my whole, I'll conclude this with this, but why am I talking about the son of Adam? Why am I talking about Elohim coming in flesh, causing things to happen? 
Why, why am I talking about it? It's if you have any understanding and belief on this, it might be a good idea to figure out who this Adam is. Science is finding out all kinds of stuff about our bodies. <clears throat> all kinds of stuff about our bodies. It's amazing what they're finding out about our bodies. Maybe this one who is maligned by so many of us come outers, maybe this one who we call Adam. Wow, I wonder what, I wonder what we made to live in. I wonder if it's worthy of investigating. Thank you. Those four letters, it's enough information stored there to go to the sun and back. <coughs> what would the rest of that 97% spell? I think it's worthy of an investigation. Yes, <laughs> somebody's sharing is the perspective and it always intrigues me to hear something that maybe I've heard it similar but not that way yeah and so I really enjoyed hearing you John because I always heard sound like looking at the same mountain but from a different perspective <coughs> so we love that we welcome that and we can't wait to uh, hear more about it hey, <laughs> I'm going to share, I don't share a whole lot, I get nervous, then I get about as red as those centerpieces. <laughs> so I'm just going to try to take my time and what I'm sharing, and you know, the country sharing, not sharing, sharing. What I'm sharing is just some stuff God's been putting on my heart, some stuff I've been studying, and I'm just sharing my truth of it. My my inner experience of, of how God revealed it to me, and it might, you guys might not agree with all of it. That's okay. It's not for you. Put it all away. Put it on the shelf or whatever. And I'm like John. I don't come against the scriptures, but I don't quote the scriptures a whole lot because I am a living book. I don't want to live his story. Not saying that denouncing the story. It was on purpose, it was on time. But we're not living 2,000 years ago. We're living today. Mm -hmm. Learning the history is good. But how are we going to implement it today? Mm -hmm. How are we going to walk in the life of Christ today? Not Jesus on the cross 2,000 years ago, but Christ today. Mm -hmm. As Christ in Christ. I let, let it be revealed through us. So, anyways. And I'm going to speak this, and then my husband's going to get up and just <laughs> correct me. Correct me, no kidding. Okay. What is it? <coughs> Put the mic up closer. Yeah. Yeah. Turn the volume up on. <laughs> okay. I titled this this understanding. You know, we can understand, but when we understand, we're under something. When we understand, it's from the depths of our being. And Kirby, I told you to turn that off. <laughs> now, now. Okay. And I, I read, and then I'll add a little. We are so consumed with living a godly life and living by and what the Bible says that we lose sight of the meaning and the power of the scriptures and the things of God. And here I'm quoting the scripture, which I don't do. Think of the scripture, 1 John 4 4. Think of this, y'all. Greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. Mm -hmm. How many times have we quoted that? This is verbatim because it was, we were conditioned to quote it, but we didn't realize or recognize the power of what we were actually saying. 
greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That includes our mindsets. That's why I said earlier, I don't want to believe it. If I believe it, it's something you've said that I've heard. But when I know it, I know it. So I don't believe in belief. There's a difference in belief and knowing. I can believe a story. I can believe your experience. But until I experience it myself, I don't know it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. We quote this phrase so much. We don't even see it here. We never realize what we are truly saying. Greater is he, God who is in you, dwelling in the inner depths of your being, not your physical body. See, we lose our identity when we think this body is who we are. We forget who he is and the power that is within us. Therefore, because we don't recognize the power within us, we give that power away. And we dwell in a negative mindset based on limited conditions. Words have power, but what power are we projecting to the universe? The power of God or the power of humanity? Now think about that. How much power do we give away when we are quoting scriptures, not knowing the power, or just quoting something someone has said, not realizing the power, whether it's negative or positive? We have such negative mindsets. We, we, you know, here we're talking about creation, creating, manifesting. Mm -hmm. Life and death in the power of the tongue. Think about what you say. And as you reckon, even if you say something negative, if you recognize it, oh, wait, why did I say that? When you begin to realize what you're saying and you catch what you're saying, that's when you begin to transform your life. Mm -hmm. Because you begin to say, wait, Amen. Amen. I really didn't mean that. That's right. So you, 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 you said something negative, but you go back and you say something positive to outweigh that. Does that make sense? It does. To overshadow that. It's like, that's right. well, I spoke negative, but you know, that's not really what I meant that's not to say, or that's not really who I am. So now I'm going to speak of my truth of who I am. So you overshadow that, and that light of the love of God overshadows a negative that you just manifested. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> or created, I should yeah. say. Let's see. The moment we acknowledge something in the realm of thought or anything externally as having dominion over us, we have made a law for ourselves and, can, and continue to suffer until we realize that the fullness of God made manifest is the infinite Son, you. And it should not be at the mercy of anything in the outer realm or any set of worldly conditions. Only in the degree that we can recognize our oneness with God, only to the degree that we can realize that we are the very presence of God, can we master the laws of the universe created by unconscious reality. What do you mean, Matthew? People are awakening to a knowing that they are seeing beyond the programmed mindsets to truly seeing the authentic nature of who they are in Christ. And it is causing a global shift and transition of the universe. Mm -hmm. Now think about that. I've that's always big. said that's big. I believe it. I've always said that. I believe it. Yeah. I use the word domestication. And some of you might might have heard me say this before. We created. Before the the birthing through the through the womb. We're created. We're manifested in the physical body as God in the physical body, as Christ in the physical body. But then, and we're pure and innocent. We're one with sorry, Beth. We're pure and innocent. We're one with God already, continually. That never ceases to be. But then we're domesticated in society. What are we taught? What to do? When to do it? How to do it? What to say? When to say it? What to believe? How to do everything in life? We're, we're conditioned. We're programmed like a computer. You program that computer of how to function. So we are programmed how to function, how to believe, and how to do things in life. So it's a learned condition, it's a program yes. condition. And it's only when we, I'm getting, I know I'm going to go back and read what I'm saying, but it's only when we come to the <coughs> awareness and the understanding yes. Yes. that we are not this physical body, we are not our mindsets, we are not our beliefs, we're not our conditions, we're not even our functions, that we're going to overcome the laws of the, of, of the world, not the universe. This is the laws of the world that man made, this is the laws of the universe that God created. Hallelujah. So we have got to understand. See, that's why God says, he's like, quit just quoting things just because. Just because it's easy, just because it's what's been done, what's been said, what, how it's been done. Stop that. Realize what you're saying. Realize what you're doing. Yeah. Become aware of it. And that's how you're going to transition and change. Not just your life, but those around you. Because when you begin to change, Carolyn, you're close with some of these people. When you begin to change, John's going to change. When you begin to change, Barbara's going to begin to change. 
And it's, going, it's a ripple effect. Yes, yes, it does. Amen. Whether they realize it or not. Yes. We've been in places that we've had people come up, and we're just sitting there talking and sharing. And people have actually come up. I want what you have. I don't know what, what you're doing, but I want it. Mm -hmm. I see the light of God on you. What are you doing? Yeah. Yes. I'm changing my mindset. Because our mindset is not, to, is not the mind of God. Thank you, Father. And I got a lot. You need a fan up here. Um, because we're looking beyond the programs of our thoughts and actions, our functionalities are changing. See, I told you to repeat myself. Stirring and causing our outward focus in reality, <clears throat> in reality to trans transition to an inner knowing, keyword inner. Therefore, our outer identities are no longer based on our concepts, Absolutely. perceptions, yeah. or for that matter, even other people's concepts, perceptions, yes. or judgments. Amen. Our true identities are being brought to the forefront in a deeper truth of understanding and knowing our purpose for being created is being revealed. Hallelujah. Now see, I didn't do a handout <laughs> like Mark did or Mike did because some of my stuff is controversial and I thought, I don't know what I'm saying, my sister brother wants to be back here and I'm thinking, oh Lord. <laughs> Mark, Mark, Mark called me a chicken. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Mike called me a chicken because I was sharing this now before they got back. <laughs> Which is okay. You know what a chicken went to the middle of the road? Why? She wanted to lay it on the line. <laughs> Ooh, yes. And as we praise God, and thank you. And thank God we are acknowledging our oneness with our Creator and that the nothingness of human selfhood and human effects can fulfill our needs. Let me say that again, so sometimes I read it too fast. As we praise God and thank God, we are acknowledging our oneness with our Creator. And that the nothingness, no, there you go, of human selfhood and human effects can fulfill our needs. Think of this. Gratitude is our relationship and our contact with God. And I heard the other day, I was in another room and I had a TV on, is that even in death, relationships will always be. Broken. I mean, Ray passed on this morning. That doesn't mean my relationship with him has to stop. That's right. The body is, has ceased to, to exist on this, on this earth. But that that he is will always be. Amen. It is in our own individual at one minute with God and trying to know God with intellect or trying to explain God. Hang on, I said it wrong. Let me go back. Gratitude is our relationship and contact with God. It is our... There it is. See, I get so confused. Okay. It is our own individual at one minute with God. Trying to know God with intellect or trying to explain God cannot be done. And I'll say this later in the thing. If you if you can define God, it's not God. <laughs> I'll say I'll, I'll quote that in the end of this. Yes. But I heard it today. I said if you can define God, then it's not God because God can cannot be defined. God can only be contacted or discerned through our spiritual senses and not our intellect or carnal senses. To develop the mind that was in Christ, we have to realize God as a center, the reality of our being, and operate as our own individual being. So see, we have to understand. Yes. There's conscious being, which is infinite, limitless. Then there's our individual yes. conscious being. Mm -hmm. So there's the beingness of God, and then as pieces of the puzzle, our own individual that makes the corporate being. Yes, ma'am. See, I'm learning this. As I share it with you, I'm learning it too. Beholding only mortal and material concepts of the body is all we can and will behold the human mind. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But with revealing of our Christ consciousness, we begin to see and sense the spiritual makeup and the spiritual universe that is being beyond, being, that is being beheld beyond thoughts. Then we can enter peace and silence, and then the divine unfolding of oneness transpires. Think of this. Silence is God in action. You know, we can pray. Barbara, you got up and prayed. I'm all for that. I'm not... Like he said, I'm not putting down scripture, I'm not putting down you for praying. My sister prayed this morning. But true prayer is when we get into silence. I was telling this with Mike and Beth last night. To me, let's say it, Kathy, true prayer is when we get into silence and we're focused on nothing and no one. No face, no body, no illness, no sickness. And just be at that peace and in that silence and allow God to commune with us. Sure. And in that communion, God reveals himself. And that's where true prayer and healing takes place. That's what I'm learning. 
we need to realize that the human mind is always going to be offended by truth. And that truth is beyond what the human mind can comprehend. When we understand and declare that the mind of God is our mind, divine spirit is our spirit, and divine love is a love of which we are all created, then we have tapped into the depth of our being. We as divine consciousness, consciousness sorry, are walking about in the world believing that the essence of that consciousness is very small and insignificant. You're going to keep hearing me say understand. It is time to understand and know that the conscious presence and power of God is infinite eternity, which we are. Because we have chosen to believe in the smallness of the allness of God, the smallness of the allness, we have divided God into many labels and demeaned his power, which demeans our power in him. We don't even realize that. We have become so ingrained in church and religion to know who we are in Christ and to know all things. But how can we know all things if we're looking outside of self? Somewhere off in the distance. Somewhere up in the sky by and by. Because when we, when we pray or we think of God, when we do we look up? We never look in. The same division we have created in God, we have created in our own world and reality. We have divided ourselves into categories, believing everything outside is who we are. We have given into the belief in hype man has created to function and survive the world, in the world. These possessions are not the reality that we need to make contact with. We need to, we need to make contact with the oneness of our existence. This happens, again, as we are silent in meditation, allowing God to reveal himself. <clears throat> but because we have separated ourselves from God, we have limited our mindsets and believe everything as truth and authentic. We have essentially turned away from God, rather, whether we realize it or not. Therefore, we are operating from and in an illusion. This illusion keeps us seeing and projecting with the physical eyes, thereby eliminating our sense of reality. The illusion keeps us believing that the falsehood is our position and purpose in God. We're so focused on what the list of what we got to do and how to do it, who we got to be, who we got to see, that we lose ourselves. Yep. All we can see with our carnal eyes is a finite, not an infinite, but a finite material concept of God appearing in the middle. Our carnal eyes only testify the negative aspect of our beliefs because they are illusion based. But as you see or testify with the beingness we then discern through spiritual consciousness, divine God, because God is the reality of our being. Again, God is divine consciousness. And since conscious, conscious, can talk. <laughs> and since consciousness is the substance and action of all form, then as long as I live and move and have my being as consciousness, all form will appear without my taking thought. Thought is what keeps us bond to the humanhood of our mindsets. Our conditioned mindsets control how we choose or decide to live and move and have our being. We either choose divine essence or in the negative functions of the world. And of course we know God's wanting this function in the divine oneness. So what we gotta do? Overcome our mindsets. Overcome our beliefs. Overcome how it's been done. How grandma and grandpa, mom and pop did it. God has manifest his individual consciousness in us and through us. Our individual consciousness is a principle or law into our individual universe and experience. Our outer experience is determined by the degree by which we by which we realize God, divine law, divine life, acting as our individual consciousness. It's still God, even when it is his, when it is our individual consciousness. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. But this does not mean that each one of us is or has a separate God. It means God is the infinite, invisible consciousness of the individual, but he is still infinite and still all power. We have to have our own divine relationship with God, but again, as we come together in the corporate beingness, the oneness of, the, of, of beingness, yeah. we, we cease to be individual and we, cease to, and we create the oneness. That makes sense. <laughs> Very good. We become so paralyzed by the power 
of negative thoughts and beliefs that we lose our identity. The outward labels we use to function in the universe becomes the identity we believe in. My name is not, I don't, I don't even like to be called Kathy because that's not who I am. People say, well then who are you? I am. Because when I say anything other than I am, because what do you say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Who do you, who, when someone asks, who do, who do you say I am? I am. So when I say, even when I say I am sick, I'm creating sickness. We don't realize, again, the power in our words. Because we have, we have limited ourselves. We say we believe in the limitless God, a God without conditions, a God that is all in all. But when we limit God, therefore we limit ourselves. God said, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a scripture person, but are we not to do more abundantly than Jesus did on this earth? We yeah. are. How can we do that, y'all? Here's my countryside. How can we do that, y'all, if we're stuck in a society, in a, in a world that we've created that is so stagnant, we've been pri we've imprisoned ourselves. Yes. You know, God told me years ago, the doors are open. You've been pardoned. Amen. You've been pardoned. Yes. Stop completely. prisoning, putting yourself in prison by the limitations of your mind. That's my pet peeve. When I when I taste and see that God is good, that God is love, and He is all in all, and therefore I am all in all. I'm not saying I'm perfect. God knows I'm not, but I get up every day making a choice to live a godly life. And I'm not saying I don't fall through the day, because I do. But you know, it's coming to a point, like I said earlier, I might say something, do something that is not me, but it's my function in the world, and I, I catch myself in the midst of the, of, of the action taking place, and I'm like, that's not who I am. I was talking about our meeting. This is why we continue to struggle and suffer because we have given our true self over to small, confined ideas that are rigid and don't measure up to the infinite God that we are. Where the heart lies, there lies not just our treasure, but God's treasure. So where, do you, where, where does your heart lie? Let me catch Hallelujah. Once we see that infinite consciousness is the knowledge of God and the relationship of God and man, we will always be running from one teacher to another, one church to another, or one book to another. We can live a very peaceful, powerful, and prosperous life, whether in or out of church, doctrine, or organization. But only if we understand the true nature of God and the divine relationship between God and man. If our heart and relationship is in right standing with God, then we can go into any church or religious organization and be at peace and harmony and have limitless communion with our divine creator. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you go into a temple. It doesn't matter where you go. If you're at peace with God, if you know without a shadow of doubt who you are and the oneness of your being, then you can go into any sect organization and be at peace and harmony with God because you know who you are. Mm -hmm. Harmony through Christ is released from the belief of mortal selfhood. It is the ascent into the realization of our Christ identity. Yes, we have a Christ identity that is more real than our human identity. We have the ability to lay down our, our human identity. After all, Jesus said, I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. But our spiritual identity of Christ is permanent and eternal. We can lay down this mortal eternity, right? Lay it down today. But his Christ, eternal identity, his Christ identity is permanent and will always be. When we begin to live from and in our Christ identity, we stop relating to our, our human birth, our maturity, and even death, and we shall achieve immortality here and now. Amen. We faithfully repeat the same statements over and over again with no fruition. Why? Because we're rambling these statements expecting different results. 
with no understanding that we were just expounding words from the external human consciousness and not the divine individual consciousness that we are. <clears throat> there is no connection with God. Therefore, we will never have any positive results. And that's our problem. We've lost our connection. We believe that if we pray, we have a connection. If you're not, if you're not praying from your heart, mm -hmm. you don't have a connection. You're just rambling words that's in your mindset. There's a saying that we are in the world but not of it. Our understanding is that we must be in the world but not of it in every aspect, relationship, job, etc. But be attached to none of it. And that's our problem. It's another problem we have. We attach to everything. Every situation, every circumstance, every experience, as we were saying, Marcus was saying, we can let go of the members, but we're attached to them. We have to let go, we have to detach. This is a problem we believe we are the labels that we and other people put on us. We limit ourselves based on which hat we are wearing. In truth, we are none of the hats. We have just attached ourselves to them and out of our need, and out of our need to function in the world. Functionality does not equal authenticity. Functionality only equals our ability to comprehend and live in our human good. It is in our realization that we are infinite beings dwelling in an earthly vessel that the disillusioned reality we have created ceases to exist. God isn't going to force you to do anything. We must make the decision to find the real meaning of who God is. The knowledge of understanding who God is allows His, our, divine presence to be present. And that's, that's another one of our, our belief systems, I guess you could say, is we're so focused on what's happening next, or what we got to do next, we're not even present for what's happening in the moment. Mm -hmm. okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> In the midst of our learned conditioning, we are taught to use words and cliches like God, Christ, and Jesus without even understanding their true meaning. We must make God as real to us as breathing. We will never truly have eternal life until we know God and not just words about God. The same is true of the word of Christ. We use the word Christ without understanding the light, power, and divinity of his presence. We ramble it off. We ramble off the word God is if we truly have a relationship with Him. But do we? Do we truly have a relationship with Him? Or are we just believing that our actions? Yeah. Are, we do in our understanding, but we don't in the external understanding. That's what I'm saying. And God's saying, get to the understanding. Get to the, the silence. That's where He's wanting us to be, in that silent, silent peaceful communion with Him. And not focus on the outward, again, function, functions that we we manifest to work up something to get in His presence. It's not about working something up, it's about being. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yes, you do. Christ is a being, a reality, not a Jesus of 2,000 years ago. Christ is a spirit that emanated out, animated Jesus beyond anything which any man can comprehend or has ever known. In the realization the manifestation, manifestation of Christ as our very being, there is nothing that needs to be demonstrated. Christ just is as God is. The moment we say the word God and think it means Jehovah on the cloud or Jesus on the cross, we have not brought God into the understand, understandable awareness in our daily lives. So when we say the word Jesus, where, where does your mind all that to go? To the cross. That's what, we're, that's what we've been taught. We have only entertained the idea of a doctrinated God that man created. Take the word of God into our heart and soul and have communion with the Father, allowing him to reveal the real nature, the isness of God. That way when we say the word God, we will know what we are talking about and the power thereof. And I've heard many well-known pastors say, that God is not the author of sin and death and disease. They don't come right out and say it in the king, say say it's not in the kingdom of God, but by saying He does it, oh wait, by saying He does it isn't the author. They don't come out and say He's not that the sin, death, and disease is not in the kingdom of God, but they do say He's not the author of sin, death, and disease. 
So they're doing a roundabout. Because if God is all in all, He created the universe as a being of light, a being of love. And we are the individual manifestation of that. And where does sin, death, and disease, where is it at in the kingdom of God? It's not. Because God, God doesn't know it. He didn't create it. Man did. All healing takes place. Let's see. See where I want to go now. Praise the Lord. I'll just keep on down here. I mentioned the word God. I mentioned the word Christ. How we we rambled off not knowing the true power or the meaning behind it. Well, now we get to the word Jesus. <laughs> this is why we misunderstand Jesus' mission to the world. God didn't send Jesus to heal the sick. He sent Jesus to reveal Christ of our being. This was his function then and now. It wasn't to revere or worship a man, but to reveal Christ into the universe. Therefore, do not use the word Christ, Jesus, or God lightly. Take them into your consciousness and connect with God and the truth of truth and meaning will unfold. There exists within each of us a divine reality that cannot always be put into words. As I said earlier, if you can find God, no, if you can, I mean, I, I, recall, I quoted that wrong. If you can define it, it's not a God. Our knowing of God comes through our conscious communion with Him. It is up to us to voice, declare, and reveal the oneness of who God is to the universe. Almost there, y'all. No one else sees or thinks about us the way we believe they do. It is only in our disillusioned beliefs that we choose to give into the imaginations we have conjured up. And I don't know about you, but I have a vivid imagination. <laughs> but again, even in this hell of the mind, and I say hell of the mind because there's a difference in, like I said earlier, but there's a difference in the mind of man and the mind of God. And the mind of man help. We choose, we still choose to follow God's path and purpose. God has a, per a path for us, but because of our choices, we veer off that path. Whether we, what we want to label it as a mistake, a sin, whatever it is. People say, you say God allowed that? And I'm not saying God allowed it, but God can use it and bring you back onto His path, into His purpose. The unconscious level takes in all information from our minds, emotions, and imaginations, but doesn't have the tools to express on those levels. It stores the information and feeds it back to us, and reveals all kinds of vague fears and illusions that frighten us, confuse us, and prevent us from seeing clearly. All these as aspects play back and forth like a recorder in our consciousness. This happens so fast at times we aren't even aware of what's happening inside ourselves. We find ourselves lost, sidetracked, or out of focus as we move through each experience trying to find God's purpose or path. When we can reach beyond all negative levels and perceive the consciousness from the positive aspect of ourselves, not our out ourselves out here, ourselves, we can lift up our spiritual eyes and see which path will lead us back to authentic reality. When this happens, we can lift up our areas of unconsciousness to strengthen us as we learn to discern from reality, to, to discern reality from illusion. Spirit is the force that gives us our life, energy, and power. It's that spark of the divine that is the source of all, source of our godness or our goodness. I don't know if any of that makes sense to y'all, but I just read what God revealed to me. I applaud you. So I'm going to let Mark come up, but if you have any questions, you can refer to him. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to share. Very good. You know, it's a uh, couple things for about 10 minutes, and then we're going to have Mike come. And I still get my time later. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just wait, uh, old things up. Got you know, <laughs> oh, what you got? Well, I'm sharing what it. Kathy docks my time later. No, I'm just kidding. I bet her. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the Holy Spirit. Um, I know you've been talking about it. I want to talk to you a little bit about the divine dance. They told me no. And. Understand that we are. Just, just uh, a few years ago, I read the book be doing some Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes by Dr. Kenneth Bailey. 
that book has really helped me understand how uh, Middle Eastern studies look at repentance. Because repentance has been a real confusing thing. But if you go to the prodigal son, the understanding of repentance was, I was lost and I was found. Or God found and discovered me. The essence of the prodigal son was not what he did, it's what the father did. So when you understand this, we come to the Hold presence on, whoa, of whoa. God. Oh, you got to back up. Okay, God uh, found and discovered me. Yeah. Okay. Because in the prodigal son, the point was not what the man did, because the father went out every day searching for him. And we have everything backwards. And we have to understand that we are all outside of the presence of God. Now, y'all know I'm talking experimentally, right? We all are positioned. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places. But as far as experimentally, we understand that all of us have become victims. And what does victim mean? It means that we have looked for something outside of Christ in you in order to achieve or be overcome. So we become victims of circumstance, we become victims of these different things. And I got a revelation the other day that was kind of an odd revelation. But Hebrews 4.12 says that we come boldly to the what? The throne of grace to what? Obtain mercy. Now I'm going to challenge you with a thought. What I was told growing up is that mercy was that God came down and I was an old, worthless sinner. And so therefore He came down and He brought me to where He was. That means that definition is in time, right? So that means that mercy couldn't be an attribute of God if it only is functional in time. So that tells me that we have things backwards because we thought, according to Scripture, that there's first mercy, then grace. But according to that Scripture, we are now experiencing a grace revolution. We've not come to understand mercy. And if you look at the book of Romans, of the giftings, in Romans 13, the last season that we've just come through was what? The ruler season. That's why the, all the church buildings, that's why all the ministries. But we're coming to a mercy season. And when you enter into this, now here's the problem. Most people talk about being in the presence of God. Talk about thinking about being in the presence of God. But that's the Greco-Roman thinking, the one-two point. We have to just enter the presence of God. And when we enter the presence of God, we enter into... now. Catch this, what I call the divine court. Now, for years, prayer was spiritual warfare. Not a divine court. But guess what happens in the divine court? You get a verdict from the judge. What does the judge say? You're free, you're pardoned. So the courtroom turns to a dance room. And we dance in communion with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Now, I'm throwing a bunch of stuff at you, but here's what I'm getting at. What we have sensed as correction, the judgment of God, I went through struggle for years. Does God permit? Does He cause? I mean, those things there just drove me crazy. I'm so thankful for me and Kathy's times of talking about God's purpose and plan because there's a lot of things in our lives that didn't make sense, but it didn't stop God from using them. I don't believe they originated in God, but God used them in our lives. But... Because of the correction and all this, it was to release His demise, His power, and now we're coming to this place of mercy. That's where I believe we're coming into. And that mercy is not us coming out and having God be merciful, oh, we are sinning. No, that is you standing in a demonstration that has never been before. I'm not talking about mercy as in pity. I'm talking about mercy as in kindness demonstrated. And that's the place that I believe we are. And when we get in that realm, we're moving out of this, I'll say this and quit, we're moving out of the realm of judgment into the realm of decrees. And I sense that as we get more and more into where we are headed, this mercy season, which they say we're only in the beginnings of it in 2004, 
and it's really now catching on, that we're going to begin to not see judgment, but decrees, because we're going to begin to decree by authority, because all this time before, we thought words were about power. That as we were talking, and even some of the things, we understand that we are now prophetically decreeing, which means in the Hebrew, it is to cut, to hack, to come, to decree. What are we decreeing? Are we decreeing something new? We're decreeing no, what was already established and done in the heavens before now. But we have to understand that there is a balance between grace and mercy and between decrees and judgment. And when we begin to discern that, Amen. we're about to move into yes. a place that we have never moved into before. I agree with that. Yes. So, I wanted to throw that out there. I'll be Mark sharing a little mercy. later. You say well, and see, I think that's the lamb that's getting ready to appear in this age. Mercy and grace. What but he's talking there about, about the decrees and about the positional movement. That's when you look in the book of Revelation about the seven spirits of God that stood before the throne and then they moved into the throne. So there is an unfolding of purpose and consciousness in time right now where we're being positioned to uh, to do those things. We are now moving into what is known as the mercy season. Absolutely. And what is the come on Mike. What is the greatest struggle for the new move of God? The old move of God. Which tells me the hyper grace people, as much as they are helping me, may be really blown by this mercy season because this is not going to be you doing good deeds. This is you demonstrating the kingdom of God that He is establishing on this earth. Mm -hmm. So I'll be talking about that a little bit yeah. more. I just, when you shared some of that, it kind of thought some stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I enjoy what you said about purpose and plan. Come on, Mike. I'm sorry I talked so fast. So I'm sorry. <laughs> it's no, I'm talking. It's it's I'm learning. No, it's you. Yes. It's always where God has been uh, that interferes with where God is now. Exactly. You know, that's what you were just, you know. And, and grace is uh, unfolding all over the planet, but we still are not seeing the demonstration. Before. I get into the Logos aspect of what I want to talk about. I want to finish with uh, Mirce Kenyatta. He was a Romanian philosopher that I was telling you about. Because he saw something that differentiates aspects of time. He saw things either in sacred time and profane time. He said that the moves of God occurred in the sacred time in the form of hieropiphanies. He said that was when the aspect of the sacred interjected into the physical realm. And he says when that happened, he said profane time stopped. He said we moved ourselves out of the physical aspect of time into sacred time. To me he's describing the present moment. The, the aspect of what we call the present moment. Who said that? Mircea Iliade. He was a Romanian philosopher. And he says that profane time can only be referenced geometrically. That it has no qualitative orientation toward God. Sacred time is not a measurement, but an experience. Hallelujah! Say oh, that again! I'm telling you right now, that is the truth. He said sacred time is not a measurement, but an experience. And he describes myth this way. He said, Myth is the absolute truth about the beginning. As the sacred brought forth the world structure and man began to describe it. Ancient yeah. cultures believe the power of a thing lies in its origin. Yep. As such, the first manifestation is therefore significant and valid. Because myth describes the sacred's first appearance, mythical time is the only time of value. Hallelujah. I really like what he said, and that brought in aspects of time. Now, he also has a concept about the fall that I want to tell you about. Oh, I'm listening. He said, as man continues to remove mythical <laughs> concepts from history, he enters into more stagnant periods of linear time where he experiences a terror of history. Wow. Iliadi says that a terror of history is where we fight the battles of, did God create evil? <laughs> Look what happened at World War III. Where was God? Did God cause the catastrophes of Katrina? All of these things we place in the terror of history. 
Then he says that when we remain in profane time, we need laws to reconnect with God. In these laws, Ooh, I love it. man that becomes... <laughs> He Did says, when Long. we remain in profane time and we have distanced or perceived a distance from God, then we have to, re we have to make laws that in our processes are perceiving to get us back to God. <laughs> this is the beginning concept of a fall. Man is, removes himself from mythical time and remains in linear time, and he perceives the fall, and then man comes up with the myth to offer a remedy. Now, as the Logos was locked in time, man lost the myth. The return required a law to point the way. Now, on this next section, I want to start talking about the Logos, and I've, lo I've named this section the Primordial Logos. We've defined primordial as before the beginning of time. That's not really the truth of that word. It's really before the beginning. Primordial is before the beginning. It has nothing to do with time. It's the first form, the pre-existent, the first begotten. I'm sorry. They're enjoying it. Oh. <laughs> Our concept of the Logos obviously comes from the prologue of John. And in that aspect, John mixed Hebraic thought, Greek thought, when he said that the Logos was a man. He put it in the aspect of one man instead of mankind. He made, or a lot of times religion has made the incarnation about a man and not men. When we look at it in the mythical aspect, I realize, well, if we try to define the first incarnation, we oftentimes put it with Jesus. But the original incarnation is something that, that John was talking about when God breathed into Adam. We were incarnated. That is the connection of humanity or of, of flesh and spirit. Wow. The perennial aspect or the perennial, perennial philosophical aspect of the Logos implies that the concept was before the Greeks, was before the Egyptians, was all the way back and has always been in civilization. There has always been an aspect of civilization that's connected with God. Our Christian heritage calls the Logos, I'm using the Logos because that is the Greek reference, but the Christian, our Christian heritage calls it calls the Logos Jesus. The Greeks called it Logos. The Hebrews called it Torah. Um, Aramaic called it Mimra, Chinese Tao. Uh, in 1500 BC, Hindu writings called it Arta, Mayat in Egyptian. And before that, in 2000 to 6000 BC, it was called Asha, the language of Persia. So the whole aspect of what John was describing existed two and three thousand years before his time. He just enfleshed it. He called it something because of something that he saw, and he says, that's it. Not that he's wrong, but all of these things added to the idea of who and what the Logos is. The perennial philosophy says that in all religions there is an aspect or a thread of truth that man has sought to connect with God. And uh, another aspect that, that Santos Bonacci talks about is the Presca Theologia. In that aspect, he says that the oldest religions had the truer aspect. So the differentiation between perennial philosophy is that the thread showed itself in all religions for those looking for it. Prisca Theologia says that it was only pure as you go back further in time. So how would we recognize the uh, perennial philosophy? 
One of the ways it promotes, um, it's Latin for summa bonum, it means the greater good of humanity. We have looked at religion, and religion points to the defeat of humanity. That's not per, uh, perennial philosophy. One of the things that Mark and I have talked about a lot is Psalms 19. I think that is one of my favorite psalms. It talks about how the glory of God is being uttered by the heavens and the stars. And it says the star's purpose is directed by the Logos. The Logos gives the star's direction. John Sanford, in his book, Mystical Christianity, he says, in describing the creative force of the Logos, the world-created Logos could be seen in the movements of the heavenly bodies, in the majesty of the skies, in the great ocean with its abundant life, but also could be seen in the tiniest unit of life, for the most important place where the Word of God was to be found <coughs> was within the soul herself, where it lived as the Imagio Dei, like a spring of water from which flowed the knowledge of God. I think the thing that this has done for me is enlarged my idea of what the Logos is. It let me understand that it has always been seen. And some of the things I said this morning that the Logos is a heartbeat. It's the sun. It's what holds the universe together. It is anything that is created is the Logos, and it's the aspect of God. In the Greek idea, it's the idea of the intent of the mind of God. It's something that He held in mind, and when He breathed, to form a word, I have got to expel air. In that aspect, on the earth, when God is put in the image of humanity or in the image of a human, when God speaks, the idea is he's also got to expel air, and the Hebrews call that ruach, the breath of God. And that's what God implanted in us. We speak and we create by words the same way he did. He is God defined the idea of creation to be word-oriented. He said for something to be created, it's got to be spoken. down y'all to the the Hebrew or the Aramaic aspect of Logos is memory and the idea of that was the voice of God and a lot of words in our Bible are transliterations words that that in their language they cannot be transferred to English Christ Logos baptism and another one is manna. If I ask you what manna was, you would tell me it was the bread that God fed the, the children of Israel. What was the bread? What was it? It was nothing. It ruined very quickly. Angel like food. Rain thing. Um, do you remember what the Hebrew actually translates it? The Hebrew is it? What? What is it? Or what's this? So, in our idea of word etymology, can you read what that says? This is manna. But I've missed the whole point. Because I've used what I've used what the word translated as manna as what's this, and I've applied this to mean it. This will not sustain life. This is a seasoning. And it's called what's this. <laughs> a lot of times we've done that with our word etymologies. We have pulled them completely out of the nourishment that they intended and apply them to something that is completely changed. So when we need to look at, or when we want to look at what Logos meant, we've got to see what John said, what Philo of Alexandria meant, what it meant to Hebrews to in the Torah. And one of the things that the Hebrews said, the Torah is um, pre-existent. They said the Torah was pre-existent and aided in creation. It was the blueprint of creation. So they made it a living pre-existent entity, the same things that we apply to the Greek Logos. <laughs> the metaphysical aspect of the Logos, if, if I ask, Pythagoras said that there were three aspects or three 
cosmological triad or cosmological trinity. He said they were the monad, the dyad, and harmony. You can't have harmony without two. One thing can't harmonize. There's nothing to compare it to. There's nothing to match that frequency, frequency that it'll resonate with. So for harmony, he said it meant it was the immediate prerequisite for beauty. It is good acting according to its own nature, and harmony is sourced in music with its source in math. It's the principle represent, representing the dynamic universe and supports the proportional relationship between cosmic components of creation. Essentially, it's saying that's the flow of the universe. The Hermetic Logos, um, the Corpus Hermeticum was translated in 1460 by a Latin mayor named Marcelino Ficiano. He said that when the Corpus Hermeticum was, was collected, it um, had 17 aspects. It was alchemy, it was astrology, it was Rosicutianism, mm -hmm. Freemasonry, Theosophy, yep. Yep. all of these aspects that were combined and it was a knowledge of ancient wisdom. Yep. During this time, one of the things that the Greeks did in their culture, it was they were called that they were a syncretic culture. That meant that they absorbed the concepts and the meanings of other gods into their own culture. One of those was Hermes. He was the Egyptian thought, but the Greeks brought his aspects and his attributes in and named him Hermes. The writer of the, of the, the, the supposed writer of the Corpus Hermeticum was Hermes Trismegistus, Thrice Great Hermes, and he was essentially a personification of the, god, the Greek god Hermes. And he said, all humanity has a divine nature. And if a right relationship with Logos, with reason, was maintained, he would ascend an upward spiritual path, resulting in a connection with the gods. And this was the ancient idea of Gnosis. Maybe. Hmm? Maybe. Maybe. I don't know that that would be actually true, but it could be true. What are you thinking? I mean... Because the condition of man, even though intellect or knowledge or gnosis is there, they still have choice. Choice in accepting the God? Accepting which path they'll take, whether it's going to rise to a greater consciousness or spiral into whatever they want it to be. Do you think that man can entertain the choice to ascend the mind? Yes. yes. That is choice. How far does that choice go uh, over the choice of God? <laughs> in this domain, I think that it, in this domain, in, in God's domain, it is what God says it would be, but in this domain, we're here to experience choice. As gods, or as human, or as soul, or as human? Oh, I'm not going to limit it. I won't limit it. So it's just to experience. Exactly. Period. In Hermetic Cosmology, Hermeticist says that there were three components. There was the Father God, there was Cosmos, the first son of God, and man, the third son. And in their concept, they said that Father God thought in his now, in his mind. The first son, Cosmos, acted on physical matter to create, and then man was left to help God rule what was created. All of these aspects still point to a cosmology that's very similar to what we accept in our Christian thought. Words uttered from the will of God instill the cosmos to create, which is vibrating thought in the air, <clears throat> through the air, causing matter to be. So, in their concept, air and breath was the womb of matter, the womb of, of things being brought into the physical manifestation. Walter Scott translates it, he says, the man who has the rebirth, I'm sorry, the man who the rebirth brings into being as a son of God, he belongs to the world of mind. He is composed of divine powers. He who has been brought, born again has come, has become the incorporeal being. He is no longer a thing visible for bodily eyes. 
He sees things no longer by bodily sense. He sees all with the eyes of mind, and thus seeing, he finds himself to be one with all that exists. He feels himself to be omnipresent and eternal. The new age, the, the new self which has thus come into being is imperishable. He who has once become a God and the Son of God can never cease to be that which he has become. That is a description of awakening. That is a description of realizing source, realizing oneness and duality removed. Some of you may remember Craig Lyons. He had an aspect of sound that he talked about in one of his uh, websites. He said, the words are a vibrational complex element characterized by movement of variable frequency and intensity. And he used an example. He said, for example, infrasound or wave are sound waves that are less than the 20 hertz, where sounds that we can't hear. It's the sound that a volcano makes, that an earthquake moves. It's a sound that is below what we can hear. Then he says ultrasound waves are the sounds that are greater than, than 20,000 megahertz, mm -hmm. and that's above our hearing. And he says that example of that would be a knifeless microsurgery. But then we have like the soprano singer who reaches a certain octave above C and the glass shatters. And he said all that is showing us is that everything has a resonant frequency yes. at which it vibrates. Yes. And he says that in that aspect that um, matter can be moved by sound, <laughs> by words. The next aspect is the Gnostic Logos. I want to cover how much, Kathy? Okay. The Gnostic Logos, that was born out of the Corpus Hermeticum, and their aspect was, let's see, all of these are myths in the aspect of, these, of the flow of the Logos that they saw it. Their thought was that Sophia was a feminine creative force, and she wished to give birth to a creature, but she didn't want her mate to know. So she used the power that was within her and created an image like herself. When the image was born or came forth from her, it was less than her. It was imperfect. So the mythology says that she hid it among the clouds so the other gods would not see. When he was older, she cast him down to the earth. And it was at this point where he became the Demiurge that was seen in Plato and all the others. It became the idea of two gods. Sometimes the concept is used in our Old Testament and New Testament God or in a God up there and a God here. And it says that He created. And He created, His creation was the union of spirit and matter. The Chinese Logos is the Tao. Lao Tzu says, There is something undifferentiated and yet complete, which exists before heaven and earth, soundless and formless, it stands alone and does not change. It is all-pervading and unfailing. It may be considered the mother of heaven and earth. I do not know its name. I call it Tao. It forced to give it a name. I shall call it great. I, I like that expression that he uses of, of the Logos. The Kabbalah has an aspect that God enacted creation through words, through letters, through the Hebrew structure of letters. And part of it talks about how that the Hebrew letters fought to be the first place with God that they wanted to be used in creation. And Bereshit 1, it was a second letter, I believe. Uh, another aspect is seen in, in the power of words was in our, in my background, the word of faith background, the name and the claimant. You have what you say. That's an aspect of creating with words. Another one is abracadabra. That's supposed to be a magical word for an incantation, but in the Aramaic it means that I create what I speak. The Hebrew says I will, I will create a spoken. John Crawford posted not too long ago, he said it's an old <coughs> Aramaic word and it says I create like the word. I like that aspect. Huh? Oh, I'm just One of the aspects that I like to look at when I did this, I like science. And I looked at the God particle, what was considered the yes. Higgs boson constant, yes. to see if it could fit as an aspect of the Logos, and I believe it does. 
if you take the universe and you rewind it to the Big Bang period of time, science says that as you approach that zero element, that the three uh, electromagnetic forces of strong electromagnetism and weak cannot function separately. They meld into one force. And as you go back to closer to that zero time, the last element, gravity, also melds into that one force. Yes. So there is not a differentiation of forces. That is the Higgs boson constant. And science says that when that thing is developed, it immediately sacrifices itself to create. I thought that was amazing. Let me. I, I thought it was very neat. <laughs> and then it condenses itself on them to become a part of your DNA. Yes. That's what they call and it. Does Donkey. it again? Yeah. It's yeah. beautiful. <laughs> and. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> In Hebrews 1 3, it uses uh, the exact representation of, G of the Son as the word in his essence in Colossians 1.17 it's compared as well um, I was thinking when I thought about the God particle and all the other aspects if God withdrew his word would the universe exist? you think so? if he withdrew, the, if he withdrew his word or his force or the upholding force I think it would disintegrate like the God particle I think it would cease to exist I think his word is what upholds my heartbeat, your heartbeat, life, the air, the sun, all of these things. Remember in Isaiah when it says that um, his word is not returned void, that it will accomplish there too where he sends it? I think in Genesis when he said, let there be, he never took back on that. When he said, I think to me, in my mind, that explains why the universe is still expanding. When he created and said, let there be, the universe is still doing this because he had set stop. <laughs> we have the echo of that word. Yes. They've actually picked that up. Really? What now? Yes. yes. They have the echo Ooh, of that spoken like word. That. Wow. They have a recording that is 54 octaves below middle C that they say is the echo of the original Big Bang. I love it. They can hear that in the background noise at the very center of the uh, universe. Yeah. Wow. That they found now? And Paul yes. Esch has created an instrument that picks that up. Yes. 54 octaves below C. <clears throat> at an amplitude that is mind-boggling. <laughs> Even four and a half billion years after it's still mind-boggling. That's amazing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In John's prologue, yeah, no. 54 decimals. Go ahead. Say it again, Jerry. They've picked that echo up of the Big Bang in the background radiation, uh, microwave noise, and uh, they say that it is 54 octaves below middle C at an amplitude that they use the word just simply mind-boggling. And uh, he's talking about that word where he created, he sent forth his word. I believe that's the echo of that word. That's amazing. That's beautiful. Yeah. Just an echo from the Big Bang where it all created, where it all began. Wow. It's still reverberating. It's still reverberating yeah. throughout the universe. And then you go back a step further behind that Big Bang, right? And we're just talking about the, the outer display of this quadrant of the universe. Well, right. And go back beyond that Big Bang, and then you start going into the eternal domains. Yes. So it's a, it's a beautiful picture. Yes, it is. <coughs> it is. In our con in our concepts of the logos in John chapter one, if we look at that, I, like I said, John is the one who defined the logos for us. And if we stop there, I think we would have missed the picture that Jerry just talked about. That we would miss the picture that. Linda had mentioned we wouldn't see the deeper, a fuller, richer meaning of Logos. So, did John say that Jesus was literally the Logos or did he say he represented the Logos? He said he was. He said he was. 
That means we was too. We is too. We are we the Logos. <laughs> we, <laughs> is too. We, we is. We are. We've got Marcus language here. <laughs> 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 yeah. well, That's right. Craig Lyons said, the Logos is designated as the power of reason, the pattern of order of things, the principal relationship, and organized structure of something. Martin Larson, he's written a book called The Story of Christian Origins. That book has got my attention from several months ago. He says that the discourse of John is not focused on Jesus, but rather on the awakened Christ. He said that John moves beyond the historical accounts of Jesus and made Jesus the mythical Christ. And he said it's the portrait of the awakened soul. Christ is the offspring of the activated mind of God. So Christ is a product of the Logos. Christ is a product of the activation. So Christ is the action of the Logos on the soul. Activation of Christ? Did you say activation? Christ is the activated product of the mind of God. And that is, the activated mind of God is the Logos. The activated mind of God is the Logos. Another aspect, Logos consciousness. What does it mean? How do we see it? One writer, when I was looking at this, he gave an idea that I thought was really neat. This is from a guy that was written in the 1800s. He, is a theos he was in the Theosophical Society. He said, if you have a piece of paper on the table and you look at this piece of paper, he says, your eyes see the paper. But he says, if you think about it, then you see yourself seeing the paper. Then there's three actions that occur. There's the object that's seen, you seeing it, and the act of perception. When we become aware of what we're seeing, that's when the paper, the wheels turn about the paper, because when I see the paper, I begin to think, well, am I going to write something on it, or am I going to make a paper airplane? So my consciousness is able to make a decision. My consciousness, consciousness is able to make a decision and step out and operate in that aspect. And he says, our world around us is alive to each of us because of three elements held in our being. He says, consciousness perceives the world and then acts. It is through our perceiving that we gain sense of color and beauty seen in the sun and the stars. He says, through our action faculties, we gain the sense of space and form. We can reach out and touch a rock and discover what firmness and stability is. We can cross a field and gain an idea of distance, of proportion, and order in lines. He said, then hearing sounds, we understand frequency, intensity, and pitch, and we understand harmony. It's the Logos interacting with the influences of our perceptions that yield truth. Our world then becomes some of our perceptions coming to birth through the active mind. And it manifestation out of these actions of our consciousness. So the Logos touches our consciousness. It touches our thought. Like at that paper, I decided how I wanted to react to it. So the Logos touches our consciousness and it gives us creativity. It gives us inspiration and freedom. But then when that happens, the ego succumbs and allows control, and the soul is awakened to the actual Logos. So I think the consciousness of the Logos happens when our, our the awareness of the Logos happens when our consciousness is touched. The Logos empowers consciousness to proceed without duality. That to me is the Christ mind. We see we are not being but one, that God is not a trinity but one. We are not body, soul, and spirit, but we are a soul. We are one. One of the things that Mark talked up, Mark and I talked about about two conferences ago was cosmological law. To me, that was a picture seen in Psalms 19. And I think cosmology has lost its place in the mythological aspect of the gospel or of, 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 of anything of us. We, we don't see it as relevant or as important, but I think we have misplaced cosmology in mythical time. We have moved it to the side. In Psalms 19, this, this is a, a translation called The Voice. The celestial realms announce God's glory. The skies testify to His hands. Great work. Each day pours out more of their sayings. Each night more, hear, more to hear and more to learn. 
In audible words are their manner of speech, and silence their means to convey. Yet from here to the ends of the earth their voices have gone out. The whole world can hear what they say. God stretched out in these heavens a tent before the sun. You know, that is an awesome picture of astrology. That is an awesome picture of cosmology, astrological aspect of the sun, the stars. I mean, do, of the voice of the stars speaking literally. No. But we can look and see, and we see a display of the awesomeness of God. Witness of the stars. The second part of that Psalms 19, we're talking about cosmology, the astrology, the aspect of the stars, the stars speaking. Then it says, the eternal law is perfect, turning lives around. His words are reliable and true, instilling wisdom to open minds. The eternal's directions are correct, giving satisfaction to the heart. God's commandments are clear, lending clarity to the eyes. You know, I remember when I looked at that verse, I wanted to see what the difference was. I wanted to see what the difference that the stars and the, and the daytime sky was proclaiming. I wanted to see the difference between the law and the ordinances of God. But there is no difference. The law and the ordinances are the same, and the stars are proclaiming what the ordinances are saying. And God is decreeing there is nothing wrong with us. The stars are declaring there is nothing wrong, there's nothing missing. <laughs> Religion has reworded the law, making it, making it hard and painful, but the decrees of the Lord still instill wisdom and open mind. You know, they're not talking about or crying about a, a dying Savior on the cross. He is not on the cross. We are not on the cross. But the cross is a beautiful picture of us meeting our Creator. It's a picture of what we are and what God is becoming one. Gerard's nemesis is the idea of desire and sacrifice. It was carried out in the midst when no man perceived guilt and separation. But the idea of guilt and separation did not touch the Logos. The, the stars and the heavens are not declaring a miss. They're not declaring a fall. They're declaring a complete one. When I looked at this and started um, studying some of this, there were two words that come to mind, mystery and magic. And I remember there was not that long ago that I would not have said those words about God. I would have not said he was mysterious, and I would not have said that he was magical. Mystery is anything that inspires awe. And I said that awe was a face-to-face -face encounter with reality. And it's also to co comprehend that you are not alone, that they are not two. When mystery is revealed, it yields light, life, and love. Magic is the ability to control or influence natural forces. Like I said, I thought these were antithetical to what God is. And I said, well, they're New Age terms. They're demonic, and they're not used in Orthodox religion. So I was wrong. Right, wrong, wrong, and right. <laughs> so, I love it. God is not hiding from us. He's waiting on us. He is a mystery that is not trying to keep from us. One of the things that I realized in a lot of these studies that I've done, every time we do this, the mystery is not something that He is keeping for me. But it's like... There is a room, a dark room, and he is there, and he said, come on in the room, and let me show you what the mysteries are. So it's not something that's hid from me. He doesn't hide it from us. He hides it for us. You know, this is one thing that I may differ from some of you on, and that's okay, but I want to tell you what, what I think about where I'm at now. Many consider humanity or man to be a spirit having a human experience. I don't see that personally. I do not possess a soul. I am a soul. I'm not trapped in the earth suit away from a primordial existence seeking release and return. I'm not looking to go back. I'm not looking to get out of this life. I want to get out of this life all that I can. 
I'm not a soul. I am a soul formed from the breath of God, an uncreated element, and with the dust of the earth, a created particle. I have the privilege of standing at the intersection of divinity and humanity. That is the totally new creation. And out of that, I am conscious of being that creation. You know, the Logos is many things, and in that aspect, it's the action on the soul to awaken to an dimension of being a son of God. I am a soul experiencing something that has never been seen, a new creation of spirit and flesh, a union of the Ruach of God and the dust of matter. I am a soul. I am a proof of animation at the hands of the great animator. And his Logos keeps marching on. So, I think that when God, I am science minded, so when God said in Genesis the account, and again if you take it literally, it says that God breathed and man became. To me that's the concept of sodium plus chloride produces salt. A third element is produced. A third element is produced. The two meld into one and producing a third. We are that new, we are that new creation. It's completely something that's never been seen. So to say that I'm spirit experiencing humanity, that is true, but that's not all of it. I am a soul experiencing something that has never been created before. Yes. And that is the privilege of seeing the intersection of humanity and divinity. That's the Logos. Yeah. Hey, Mike. Yeah. Can I, uh, you know, back to uh, the uh, 54 octave below middle C that you was talking about a minute ago. You was talking about the Higgs boson particle. Uh, are you familiar with the grand unified field theory? I did see some of that in my notes, but I didn't, or in, my, in the studies, but I did not go that direction. The grand unified field theory says that all these different forces in the world, gravity, electricity, light, all these different things, have a common origin that uh, the mystics used to call the prima materia. And there has been a lot of science gone into that and they've looked at the inner structure of the nucleus of an atom trying to find what it is that keeps everything from flying apart. Because if you look at the nucleus of an atom, there's no reason for it to hold together. Yet, you know, the, it, it's a basic principle of physics that two light particles will repel each other. Right. And you've got the nucleus of an atom with all these protons with the same uh, charge. They're holding together. There's there with the neutrons, which have no charge at all, which would have no effect on it. And they're trying to figure that out. And they think that that force that's holding them together is what is causing the, the nucleus of an atom to not just fly apart <laughs> in, into <laughs> oblivion. They call it... They call it the Grand Unified Field Theory. They're looking for this cohesive force. I was reading this article where they're interviewing this physicist from the University of California at Davis. And he was talking about the Grand Unified Field Theory. And he said they're looking for this <coughs> cohesive force that's holding the nucleus of an atom together. Later that night, I was reading in the book of Colossians. And I was reading the Concordant Translation. And it says, and this physicist from the University of California used this term, this cohesive force. Yeah. And it said that Jesus is the cohesive force of all creation. Mm -hmm. <coughs> he is the cohesive force. That's a book in Colossians. 117. Yeah, 117. He is the cohesive force of all creation. Yeah. All righty then. <laughs> yeah. Which Einstein postulated that that was his greatest blunder. Right. Was that unified field theory. And it was three weeks ago that the scientists have observed the fourth dimension. It's when two black holes connected and they got it. Yeah. And thought it was a new opening. 